Well, I'm just back from a wonderful two-week trip to England with my uh, Word on Fire team. We traveled from Durham in the north to London in the south by way of uh, Leeds and uh, Liverpool and Birmingham and Oxford, as well as some side trips to Lindisfarne, that great uh, the kind of ruins of a Benedictine monastery from long ago, and then to Ampleforth, which is the biggest um, active Benedictine house in England, and finally to Castle Howard, which is uh, the place where they filmed a lot of Brideshead Revisited, one of my favorite programs. So it was just a great tour of, uh, of England. And I was giving lectures and talks and, and so on. And I was struck over and over again, I must say, by the vitality of the church in England. Certainly it's a society which has become largely secularized, they say, but the church, I must say, is, um, is vibrant in many ways. And I was very moved, for example, by my talks to seminarians in Birmingham and, uh, and London. Uh, gave some academic lectures in Durham and London. So it was just a great, you know, uplifting trip. But you know, the other enduring impression I have from that trip is how the 16th century is still very much a living reality. Now, when I say 16th century, of course, I mean that really terrible period uh, when we had the wars of religion, basically, in England, when um, the Anglican Church had split off from the Catholic Church and then under Elizabeth I, Catholics were pretty brutally uh, persecuted. What struck me was how that's not just a distant event in the past. That's still very much of a lively uh, reality. I'll give you some examples. We went to Ushaw College, which is a beautiful place. It was a seminary, Catholic seminary near Durham for many, many years. Just closed because the numbers got too small. But they showed us the treasures of, uh, of Ushaw, and they included these little tiny liturgical vessels, uh, chalices and crudes and so on. Why tiny? Well, they were used during that recusant period when they had to say mass very clandestinely and had to hide vessels. They also showed, I was very moved by this, a, an altar stone, so a little uh, stone that had the relics of a saint in it, and they would say mass on that altar stone. But it was the size of a shingle, and it was, it was carved as a shingle so that after mass, they just put it up on the roof to hide it, you know. Um, we went to Durham Cathedral, a magnificent building, and we saw there the, the ruins, a few little remnants of these lively, colorful frescoes, which had been stripped away, of course, during the iconoclastic uh, Protestant period. I went back to Leeds, where I was a few years ago, and we visited um, the cathedral there, and I, I did a video a few years ago about this, the, the skulls of these two martyrs that are in the altar at Leeds. It's a very moving story about a young priest and his uh, older uh, protector, who were both arrested and they were, they were killed, and their skulls have found their way to, um, to that altar. I was at uh, Oscott College in uh, Birmingham. When I was there, they showed me the pulpit from which John Henry Newman gave the great Second Spring Address. That was a talk upon the um, restoration of the Catholic hierarchy in England so that they established dioceses and bishops again after you know 300 years of, of repression. Um, I went to Allen Hall, which is the Catholic seminary in London. Where is it built? Well, it's built right on the site of Thomas More's great house uh, by the river in Chelsea. And uh, there's actually a mulberry tree from the 16th century that Thomas More would have known, still on the grounds. And of course, Thomas More, who famously opposed the um, act of supremacy and paid for his opposition with his life, having been beheaded in 1535. I ended up a trip in uh, uh, St. Patrick's in Soho, which is a very lively Catholic parish. And we rolled out the series. I talked about the Catholicism series, and I gave a little talk. And at the end of that, the pastor handed me a, a reliquary with the relics of one of the London martyrs from that period and asked me to bless the crowd with it. So over and over again, you see the 16th century alive, this time of terrible um, repression. You know, some of it was summed up for me on a very brief visit, one of the few downtimes I had. I went to uh, Westminster Abbey. And many years ago, I'd visited and visited the tomb of Elizabeth I. But this time, I had a little audio guide, you know, so I was getting more information. And I didn't realize that in the very same grave as Elizabeth I is her half-sister, Mary Tudor. And, of course, Mary was the daughter of um, Henry VIII. She was queen for a short period and, of course, instituted Catholicism in England, and then she died and was succeeded by Elizabeth, who then turned on the Catholic Church. So it's very moving to think of those two women in the same grave, and so much of history, you know, has turned around that conflict. 
Now, I bring all this up not to uh, demonize uh, Anglicanism. As I mentioned, uh, during Mary's reign, brief as it was, there was a, a terrible kind of bloody war against the Protestants. And so there's there plenty of blame to go around in terms of this uh, terrible persecution. The reason I bring it up is to show the absolute centrality of this issue of religious liberty. Now, I know a lot of us have been talking about it recently, but that's what was going on in the 16th century it was a massive and very violent repression of religious liberty. See, why is that so important? I think it's why it haunts the English imagination to this day. Because, as John Paul II said, religious liberty is the most fundamental of the rights that we have. Think of the right to, you know, um, assembly, the right to speech, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the right to worship as one uh, sees fit and to live one's religious life as one sees fit is the most fundamental of the rights. Why? Because it has to do with the most important relationship we can possibly have, that with, with God, and it reaches down to the deepest level of one's personhood. We speak of the person as inviolable. You know? Well, what's the deepest level of the person? It's that person in relation to God. And that's why religious liberty is absolutely fundamental, why it's basic. Something I find fascinating, look at up and down the centuries. Tyrants, both ancient and modern. Elizabeth was a tyrant, you know. But tyrants, both ancient and modern, first go after religious liberty. See, because a tyrant wants to reach into that place. That's what a tyrant wants. They want not just to dominate people's bodies, if you want. They want to dominate the mind and the soul. They want to get into that most sacred place where God alone should reign, you know? And that's why we'll find it. Look at, at the Soviet Union. Look at, at communist China. Look at any tyranny. They go after religion first, you know? That's what we saw, I think, in, um, in England in the 16th century and why it still haunts uh, uh, the English church to this day. Now, as I mentioned before in these videos, and I don't want to over-dramatize it. What we're going through now is nothing like the 16th century, nothing near, anywhere near as brutal as that. Nevertheless, there is um, an attack within the secularist uh, society against religious liberty. What's interesting to me in England is the old foes, by which I mean Catholics and Protestants, are now coming together because they both feel the attack coming from a secularist ideology that wants to kick religion off the public stage. And of course, as I've commented before, we do find in our country now as a more secularist kind of ideology, does it seem want to exclude um, Catholicism from the public arena? Here's my overall point, and I've, I've talked about this before, but um, see, this ought to concern everybody in a free society, not just Catholics, not just religious people. It ought to concern everyone because an attack on religious liberty is an attack on the most fundamental human right, and that's dangerous for anyone in a free society.